guess there were two inaccuracies in that article about Todd. One was that he's on staff, and the other was that he warms up the audience. <laughs> ago, we had our annual ministry picnic at our home, and each year I borrow a couple of jet skis and wave runners so that young people, I guess the older people too, can spin around the lake on them and have a good time. And for each of the last three years, one of the our neighbors have been very gracious to loan us his way runner. And it seems an appropriate thing that if you borrow somebody's wave runner and they fill up with gas, that you would return it full of gas. So on Sunday afternoon, I called him up to see if he had a gas tank, a gas can that I could borrow. You know, these gas cans for boats are usually, what, six gallons or something? Is that the right size? And they have these large spouts on them, and you can bend the spouts, so they're very convenient. He was not home. He was out of town. Not expected back for late in the day. So finally, I figured, well, you know, I need to get this deal done before it gets dark. And so I owned a uh, two-gallon gas can. A two-gallon gas can which is much smaller than a, you know, like a six-gallon gas <laughs> And so I said, well, you know, it's going to take three times as long, but, you know, how much gas could a wave runner hold anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so I got in my car, and I went up to the gas station, and uh, I put my credit card into the gas machine and put, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to really try to max it. And so this particular can actually holds 2.25 gallons if you fill it all the way until just before it starts to run out the lip of this thing. Now this gas can does not have any spout. It has a cap, <coughs> but no spout. So when you want to pour the gas out of the thing, you have nothing to help you. However, <clears throat> I looked around in our garage and I found a funnel that my son has, which I have since determined is not for this particular kind of use. <laughs> Obviously, this funnel, is, the principal use of this funnel is to put some fluids like probably oil or brake fluid or something like that. Oh, there's, I never looked at that. <laughs> I, honestly, for this moment, it says trans fluid and power steering, okay? It doesn't say not gas, but I can tell you it's not gas. <laughs> so I came back to the house, and I went down to the lake, and the wind was blowing. <laughs> And so I made the mistake of putting the funnel in. I'm trying to hold the funnel with one hand because it doesn't actually just fit in where it's supposed to be. You have to hold it at the right angle. And then propping this gas can against my thigh, I'm pouring the gas out of this hole into this funnel. And of course, the wind is blowing, and the gas is going everywhere, and I'm having trouble holding it. And then the wave runner, because of the wave action, is going back and forth like this. So I'm going back and forth like this in the wind. So I said, well, I'm glad there's 2.25 gallons in this tank. But, as you might suspect, when I finished, I had to go back to the gas station. And I said, you know, this is a small price to pay. This is a, this is, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm serving my brothers and sisters yesterday, and uh, it's, it's a gracious thing to do to return this wave runner full of gas. I'm a Christian. This is an act of service. I'm doing this with great joy. <laughs> <laughs> and so the second trip to the gas station and back, I was thinking, 
you know, I'm really suffering for Jesus here. <laughs> and then the third trip, and then the fourth trip, and then as I'm driving back to the house from the fifth trip to the gas station, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, I don't care who Christ is, this better be enough gas. <laughs> I get back to the house, I fill this thing up, I'm praying, Lord, let this be a 10-gallon tank, Lord, let this be a 10-gallon tank, drip, 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 drip. Still, I have to go back to the gas station for a sixth time. And I'm thinking to myself, I cannot believe what an ordeal this is. So finally, I get the sixth tank of gas. And I put my credit card in, and of course it won't take my credit card now because it's been used so many times in this machine, they have an anti-theft provision. So I have to humiliate myself and go inside and buy $2 worth of gas. And the guy has seen me come and go every time. So I said, hi. <laughs> Do you read books? Would you like to have a copy of The Man in the Mirror? You can be a Christian too, like me. <laughs> That's not what I did. <clears throat> so, the bottom line of this is, if you don't have the right equipment, you can waste a lot of effort. However, even if you have the wrong equipment and you put the right fuel in the machine, the machine will work properly. But even if I had all the right gas cans and I made the air and put diesel fuel in that wave runner, it would not have worked. Last time we were together for this fathering series, I made the comment to you, and the time before that too, that four out of five young people who grow up in evangelical churches will drop out by the end of their senior year in high school. The last time we were together, I said that the, the number one focus of a father should be to give his children a heart for God. And we talked about practical things that a dad could do, like prayer, like modeling, like instructing. We talked about three practical things that kids themselves could do. Church, go on mission trips, do devotions. And in some sense, all of these things are very good. But in another sense, they're all like the equipment. They're not the fuel. And you can get all of these things right, men, and your kids can still leave the church. So what I want to talk to you about this morning, you can get all of the things wrong that we did, or some things wrong that we talked about last week, but you cannot afford to get wrong what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. You have to get this one right. Now, why do kids leave the church? Well, really, for the same reason that adults leave the church. There are two very pressing questions that I think a lot of us struggle with. The first one is, can a Christian lose their faith? Can a Christian lose their faith? And secondly, how can someone attend church, profess faith, then walk away as though nothing had ever happened. And I want to show you this morning, I want to answer those questions. This is for your young people and for adults too. Can a Christian lose their salvation? And how can someone attend church, profess faith, and then walk away like nothing had ever happened? Is this a troubling question in a general way as well as a particular way? Okay, let's talk about this then. I want to show you if, you, if you can grasp this, you can forever resolve this question in your mind. 
You should be turning your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Now watch what I do up here. Let's just say that this box, this square, represents the world. And then let's say that this box inside of that square represents the church, the visible church. With me so far? And then inside this visible church box, I'm putting a third box, which I will call the invisible church. Now watch how this works. Someone, I'm going to draw four, four dots out here, representing four different kinds of people. Now here's how this works. One person in the world uh, never comes into the church. They live their whole life and go out the other end never having come into the <coughs> visible or the invisible church. That's pretty clear what happens there. But then you also have a person who comes into the visible church here, but they never, and they profess faith in Jesus, but they never truly surrender their lives to Christ. They have all the right language, all the right emotions, all the right head knowledge, but they've never truly yielded their lives to Jesus in faith and repentance. And so they live their whole lives over here in this visible church, and they don't make it. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. The word of God says, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. This explains how someone can have all the right words, do all the right things for a season, but then at the end, bail out. Now, a third kind of person comes into the visible church, and this is what happened to me. Uh, I joined into the ongoing, regular activity of other Christians. Um, in other words, I joined a group of people who were Christians, thinking all the time, professing to be a Christian, thinking I was, but then one day waking up and realizing that there was something very different and then moving into this invisible church by confessing that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior and a Lord for my life. And so this person begins first in the visible church and then goes to the invisible church and then they end up being with the Lord. Everybody with me so far here? Now the final person is the person who perhaps has not been in the church. They come to something like what we're doing here. They hear the gospel, and they go straight into this invisible church and then become part of the, the larger body of Christ. But they go right into true faith, never having been in a covenant relationship with other believers. And then, of course, they end up being with the Lord. That's it, man. That's it. That's the deal. Now, here's the big idea this morning. It is not enough for your children to be found in church. They must be found in Christ. Amen. It is not enough for your children to be found in church. They must also be found in Christ. Now, a couple of things here. Thank you, Jim. 
if a child attends church and then falls away, there are a couple of possibilities. One possibility is that if you truly lose it, you truly never have it, you would be one of these people who, even though you were involved in the visible church, you were never involved, you were never a true believer. You were a professor of faith, but not a possessor of faith. These people in the invisible church are truly regenerated. These people in the vi visible church are not. But only the visible church are not. So one possibility to explain why four out of five children growing up in evangelical churches drop out by the end of their senior year in high school is that they never were regenerated. Their parents had them in church. They were found in church, but they were not found in Christ. That's one possible explanation. A second possible explanation is a temporary lapse. In other words, it is possible that some of the children, the four out of five that drop out of the church, are truly regenerate people. But they go through a season of prodigal, or they uh, some kind of a, a temporary lapse. How do you know? You don't know. What's the message? <laughs> the message is is make sure that you understand. It's not enough that they be found in church. They must be found in Christ. You want. We all want our children to be here. We all want our children to be in the true church of Jesus Christ. Not just in the visible church, but in the true church of Jesus Christ. Will a child found in church generally be found in Christ? What do you think? It's just not that easy to say. Is being found in church a good thing? Yes. Is being found in church sufficient for salvation? No. Will a child found in church, excuse me, will a child found in Christ generally be found in church? Yes. Will a child found in Christ necessarily be found in church? No, because there are temporary lapses. Is falling away from the church a good thing? No. Does it necessarily mean the child is not a Christian? No. Now I want you to turn to uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And I want to talk to you, I want to help you answer the question. What must our children do to be part of the true church, the invisible church, to be in Christ? The simplest explanation of the gospel that I've ever been able to find is this single verse, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And this really is, uh, you know, Paul had his gospel, everybody has their own. Uh, you can, you know, but you can summarize the gospel in so many different ways. You're right. I'm always reminded when I say that of the story of the three blind men trying to describe the elephant. One grabbed the leg and said, well, it's like a tree. The other grabbed its trunk and said, well, it's like a hose. The other grabbed one of its ears and said, well, it's like a great fan. All are they right? And so what is that explanation of the gospel that really explains all of the parts? This one verse does a pretty good job. This one verse does a pretty good job. Let's read it. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now there are three parts of this. And I'm going to give you, uh, this is, this is, I think this is a wonderful way. You can use any, any method you want to explain to your children how they can be found in Christ and not just in the church. Be true Christians, true believers, firmly visible church, he generated all those different ways of saying it. This is a very, uh, I think a very nice way of explaining it. And I have decided that this is, this is the way that I want to explain the gospel now on, basically. And I gave this in a talk here once a couple of years ago, and I never got it out of my mind. In fact, I've included it in this new book, Coming Back to God. The whole idea, everything in the book builds to this idea of showing men how they can come back to God and receive Christ. And so here it is. Point number one is that Adam failed. Should I give you the whole outline and then fill it in? Yes. Adam failed. Jesus nailed. Grace prevailed. And you see these three moving parts, the tree, the pose of the fan. You see these three parts in this verse. The first part of this verse says, for the wages of sin is death. This is the problem of man. And in theology, this would be the doctrine of man. And we might say about this whole wages of sin is death problem that Adam failed. We need to explain to our children that you are a product, paradoxically, a product of both the creation and the fall. The creation has made you like a god, and the fall has made you like a devil. In other words, the creation saw the hate. What is man that you remind him? Love him, the son of man that you care for him. You make him a little lower than the gods, a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. Son and daughter, you are the full expression of God's creative genius. But also, child, Romans 6, 23, uh, Romans 3, 23, 3, 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me read it to you right out of the book. The true tragedy of our existence is not what we have become, but what we could have been. We all sense by intuition that mankind has not reached its potential. We each have an instinct that tells us the human race was destined for better, that our dignity has been tarnished. Logic tells us that something catastrophic has happened to mankind. Christianity teaches that this catastrophe took place in the Garden of Eden. So that's one thing we need to explain to our children, that though created with dignity and for glory, that has been tainted by sin, Adam failed. That's point number one. The wages of sin is death. The next piece of this is that the gift is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the issue of Jesus. This is the doctrine of Christ, if you will, in theology. Okay, so with man, you know, this is a little, somebody, you know, when you get into Harley's, people start doing little funny things. So somebody sent me this little <clears throat> Harley Dowson guy in Canada. I guess he must ride a Harley, or wishes he did. <laughs> Most people don't wish they did. <clears throat> That's the problem of man. But after that comes the issue of Christ. There is Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. What is the problem that solves? We need to, we need to tell our kids, can it's not enough to be found in church, you have to be found in Christ. Now, there's Jesus Christ. This is a wonderful image to, to talk to your children about. You say, okay, now imagine there's Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. What is the problem that solves? 
Well, the problem that it solves is the wages of sin is death problem. It solves the human problem. The Christ issue solves the man problem. And so, we all know John 3.16. Hopefully our children are learning that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish and would have everlasting life. Everlasting life. Now, turn with me back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. What is the problem that Jesus Christ solves? The problem is, is that because of the sin, man needs a savior. If you don't think you need a savior, then Jesus doesn't answer any questions you're asking. So, our children need to understand the problem is that Jesus solves is that we need a Savior. And look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. In other words, the death of Jesus on the cross, the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross, is, satisfied, is satisfactory, it is sufficient for anyone who wants to take advantage of it. You still have to take advantage of it. He died for the sins of the whole world. You still have to put your faith in it. But his atoning sacrifice is sufficient for every sin. And the point our children need to understand is no matter what you've done, you can be saved. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. Adam failed. As an atoning sacrifice, Jesus nailed. And then the third thing we see in this text today, Romans 6.23, is the free gift, the gift of eternal life. Or you might call this the doctrine of salvation. So we've had the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of salvation. We've had the problem of man, the issue of Jesus, the gift of eternal life. We have Adam failed, Jesus nailed, grace prevailed. We had a man come here one morning. We were talking about Christ over at the end of the session. He said, well, I just, I, I just don't feel like I'm worthy. And I said, you're beginning to understand. You're beginning to understand. There's nothing that you can do to be good enough for Jesus to love you. There's nothing you can do to be good enough for Jesus to love you. What did I just say? No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. So no matter what you've done, you can be forgiven. And no matter what you do, you can't be good enough. It's a gift. It's the gift of eternal life. And all one, all you need to do, child, to receive this gift is to do what the Apostle Paul said, and that is to turn to God in repentance and to turn in faith to Jesus Christ. And you can do that by inviting him in, and you can invite him in by praying. I did this with my daughter. She was six years old. I used the Four Spiritual Laws booklet. And uh, I just read it to her. And she, we got down to the end, I said, Would you like to pray this prayer and invite Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive your sins? And she said, Yes. And we prayed together. She was six. Two years later, when my son was four, children would not only be found in church but in Christ. 
Some have had children who came into the visible church but have not yet come into true faith and repentance. And maybe they've already gone out into the world now. And maybe, maybe that father's heart is breaking. Lord, I pray that you would give him back his son, his true son, in faith. Lord, there are many men here who have sons and daughters who are in the visible church. I pray that you would help each man here to reckon with whether or not that child is also part of the invisible church, that he would make sure of his children's salvation. Help them to understand that grace has prevailed through Jesus Christ. And Lord, for whatever other issues raised out of this, Lord, I pray that you would minister through your Holy Spirit to each of these 